Hello everyone, welcome back to a special edition of the Mr. Smelly Fragrance Show. So today it's a really exciting one and I'm going to introduce you to a brand that might be new to a lot of you viewers out there and that's Meleg Perfumes and the gentleman behind the brand is Matthew Meleg, a perfumer from Canada. So we're going to meet him today. The brand is really exciting and right up my street. I think I first found out about them from a video by Wafts from The Loft who did a great overview of some of their fragrances. And uh, they're a brand that use old ingredients and are inspired, I think, by, by some old recipes from the old classic perfumes. Uh, so they're non-IFRA compliant in terms of their ingredients. So you get real oak moss and some of the stuff that you just can't get even in your, your niche brands and certainly not in your modern designer brands. So a really exciting fragrance brand. Um, and, and he's sent me the sample set of a real wide range of his fragrances here. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say there's something for everybody here. Um, there's there's a, a fougere fragrance that I really like and some much more exotic, uh, boozy ones, tobacco ones, really exciting stuff. So let's get to meet the man himself by the wonders of modern technology. Matthew Meleg, welcome to the show, hello. Hi guys, good morning, um, or I should say good afternoon to uh, you folks there in England and Europe and the interwebs. Uh, <laughs> my name's Matthew and welcome to my little studio. Th thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. So uh, yeah, Matthew, you, you, so you, the brand is Meleg Perfumes and you're over in Vancouver in Canada, right? Yep, that's right. Um, Vancouver here, it's a, it's a medium sized city in Canada, about mm -hmm. 3 million. Um, I would say, you know, quite large. It's a young city, not much, much old architecture, but we make up for it with rainforests and mountains and we have um, the killer whales. And if you ever plan on coming to Vancouver, come in the summertime because it rains all winter long. Um, but it's quite a pleasant city. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a resort. Yeah, lots of skiing and and uh, Pacific Northwest of Canada, giant, giant trees. <laughs> Fancy, yeah, well, I've seen, yeah. Uh, sadly, I've never visited Canada, but I've certainly seen some incredible uh, scenery and nature out there, which may come into things a little bit because I think that played a part in your, your inspiration with, with the perfumes. That's right. uh, but so well, let's find out a bit more about that. So, um, well, before we actually dive into the details, just quickly to sort of do a bit of uh, important kind of housekeeping, if people want to find out about your brand, uh, would it be the easiest thing to just go to your Etsy store? Well, that's right. Um, I started with Etsy. Um, mm -hmm. I do have, and I do everything myself. So I have a standalone site coming, mm -hmm. um, which I'm designing uh, myself. You know, I'm a very small right. operation. It's just myself and my wife. Um, but they can go to www.meleg, M-E-L-E-G, P-A-R-F-U-M, dot com Melig Parfum. I will I'll link it in the description for the video. Yeah, and I'll put okay, it in a comment perfect. so they can just click straight on that, no problem. Uh, exactly. Okay. And it will take them to the site where um yeah, thanks so much. You know, it's an honor right. to be here. And if you ever come to Canada, you stop in Vancouver, I'll show you my little All right. my, my little uh laboratory here. I'll hold you to that. Yeah. Uh okay, you, so you can. and beer. <laughs> Ah, well, beer, we'll come on to beer later, yes. As long yes. as that's involved, then I'm usually happy, you'll find. Um, so, yeah, you've been doing the, uh, making fragrances for, I think, I think you said roughly four years, and your brand's been going for around about a year. Uh, but tell us a bit more about how you got into creating fragrances and how the brand Meleg Perfumes came about. Well, I would say... Um... I've always been a creative person, um, introspective, actually not shy, but self-driven activities, sort of a only child on a farm, mm -hmm. on an apple orchard. And I spent a lot of time actually painting and designing things, making things with wood, um, just me and the apple trees and the fruit trees. So all of my life, always been doing creative stuff. Went to university for oil painting, and oh, wow. um, yeah, for graphic design as well. And lived in Japan for a long time, and I really studied a lot of their work methods and methodologies, which is a very kind of long, um, for me, interesting conversation. But um, the roots of my 
creative process is in sort of the handmade um, way of doing things. Uh, so all of it springs from my appreciation for making things by hand. Now, the actual making of the perfumes, about four and a half, nearly five years. The mm -hmm. first two and a half years was studying materials. Right. So um, I have an apothecary set of drawers behind me, about um, 48 drawers and about 300 materials. And so right. I spent the first two and a half years memorizing these materials, hmm. how long they last, what they smell like, all these sorts of things. And then um, this in conjunction with, uh, I've always collected older books. Um, and, 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 and so I collected these older apothecary um, Victorian uh, books. And it was a sort of synergistic um, and, and analysis of the individual materials in combination with my old books collection that sort of got me started, I, I would say. Right. Um, anyways, so that that's the spirit of the beginning of my creation. And I just started selling about um, less than a year ago. And I never thought, um, uh, you know, I used to hang out on a perfumers and maker forum and mm -hmm. someone there said to me, you'll never sell any perfumes. You'll never make anything of yourself really. And that summer I, I went to Toronto and I visited Victor Wong from zoologist. Great yes. guy, really nice guy. And yeah. I showed him some of my perfumes and he said, you know what? They're not bad at all. Just try to sell them, see what people think. And that's how I got started. So one guy said, you'll never make anything of yourself. <laughs> Another guy who probably knows what he's talking about and said, no, nah, people might like them. So I did that. Um, lo and behold, people did like them. Yeah. And um, in the last two months, I've actually, because I have a hernia, I focused right. solely on making perfumes. So mm -hmm. I am officially now, at least for the last two months, only making perfumes. Don't forget, if you'd like to join the Smelly Army Private Members Club over on Patreon, there's a link in the description to do that. It costs just $2 a month and you get an extra video from me every week. Plus, you get to watch everything I've already uploaded in there. We're building a really nice community, lots of interaction, and I'd love to see you in there. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, so I hope that the, the, the health situation is, is going to be sorted soon. Can I just... We're uh, scheduled. We're fine. We're scheduled. Okay, for, that's good. Yeah. Can yeah. I just ask what you do? So you said you've just now become full time with the perfumes. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, what was the other thing that you were doing before? I am a grunt. So I grew up on a farm and basically what I was doing was a machine operation. Okay. Yeah. On a farm. I've got, yeah. I've got wow. a, you can't really see, but I've got like an 18 inch neck. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I am a fucking pit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> shouldn't swear but i'm built with the tank you know right oh, okay yeah so if you see me in regular life you'd never expect that um i make perfume but i i've always done labor oh I've wow labor okay. i was for several months disinfecting the city's bus system okay. from the covid wow um and then i got on to be a driver but my hernia was really bothering me so i couldn't carry through with that now i'm focused on the perfume okay. and i'm so glad that i'm focused on the perfume now because it's been i maybe there's a lot of people out there like me but you spend a lot of the time in in your life working for other people trying to be very practical because money is important you can't survive mm. without it unfortunately not right and and you gotta yeah. be and you gotta you gotta make compromises. And this is the first time in my life that I've actually just solely engaged with something that I like. So I feel very honored and very wow. lucky to be doing this. And um, things are going okay. I'm making the rent. I'm yep. delivering good perfumes to people, and that's what matters most to me. I want to keep the quality. I'm not looking to make a million dollars. Just yep. get good stuff out there to people. That and is brilliant. You, you know, my dream. So that's yeah. awesome. Oh, it's an interesting story then. Yeah. And I mean, you, you obviously it's great. You've, you've, you've kind of uh, backed yourself there and you, you take a risk in life and pursue what you really love. 
Uh, but it's always a bit scary, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, of course, it's not like a, a regular uh, salary or anything like that, especially when you start out. So it's it's probably hair raising. But I think from what I've smelled, I think there's every chance it's, it could work out rather well for you. So let's talk Thank a bit you. about the, the fragrances themselves yep. and your style of perfumery. Because one of the things that really interested me was when you said you had some old apothecary books. Or I think you've yep. mentioned even old recipes from uh, way back in the twenty early, early to mid 20s. 20th century or even before and you've taken oh, yeah. that as a little bit of a, a starting point or an inspiration yes. for your fragrances the kind of classical school of perfumery so yes. can you just if you can give us any examples or tell us a bit more about that with the old recipes i found that pretty interesting right well i do have oh up in my shelves there all of my books um uh just one that comes to mind is a mr peace p-i-e-s-s-e -E. And I right. believe he wrote a book around 1890 with wow. generic formulas. So the way it used to work is um, old perform perfume generic base formulas were not secret. Um, they were shared amongst the various drug stores and apothecaries throughout England and France. Right. Um, uh, the English is sort of actually, they got on board first with it around the 1750s. And it was actually the French who took a lot of the English formulas and, um, well, they would probably say improve, but I'll leave that up to you. You guys are in Europe. I'm, you know, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so England has a very long history of uh, various apothecary stores sharing generic formulas. Now, as a perfumer, what you have to do is you take these old formulas and find the balance and incorporate new materials. Go and search for old materials if you can't find them what you have to do is make tinctures and that sort of thing. So mm. one of the main materials is this. Um, this is a civet musk. Right. Tincture. Now this one here is about 10%. Um, okay. And so I tincture this. Um, it's from an See? Ethiopian kind of ferret very large ferret mammal this is natural musk um, wow so hang on uh, yeah so you actually drop. make your own tinctures of a lot of yes. these ingredients right and that's I have, obviously just, uh, yes. just for viewers who don't know civet is a sort of an animalic ingredient which comes from uh cat's glands right yes exactly but so i'll I let you explain more now about this yeah yes <laughs> yeah this starts off as a paste yeah. In the pouch, in the marsupial sort of pouch, in the gland mm -hmm. pouch, near the civet's um, rear quarters. Mm -hmm. And in Ethiopia, they farm them. Some civet farms treat their animals better than others. Where I get my civet, it's from a gentleman in Hamilton, Ontario. He goes to uh, Ethiopia and he gets large quantities of this paste. I buy right. the paste from him mm -hmm. and I tincture this for months and months and months. At first it starts off smelling like, uh, oh, you're in England. So maybe you don't, you're not old enough, but you don't quite remember the great stink. Um, <laughs> the old sewage parts off smelling horribly. Okay. And then over months and months and months of tincturing, yeah. It becomes this beautiful, beautiful material that you use. Oh, I got some in my hand right now. I can tell you what it smells like. <laughs> um, I'll put some on here. The ladies love it. You know, it feels... uh, I have a story. <laughs> I have a story for you actually about yes. the civet musk. This is kind of X-rated. Um, okay. Um, the gentleman, uh, I don't know if uh, you know the term dandy. Yes. Okay, dandies came into fashion sort of when they were getting rid of the wigs. And um, the dandies came into fashion probably around romanticism, around 1840, 1850s. But the dandies used to take civet paste and mm -hmm. they swore by it. They put the civet paste on their foreskin and they swore the women loved it. They went mad. <laughs> oh my God. Um, anyway, you can keep that in there if you like. Yeah, you I know, think we can. I, no, my viewers will like that. So yeah, that, just in case any yeah. viewers don't know, I think a dandy is was a very uh, well-dressed man who probably was kind of excessively concerned with his appearance and looking good, like a peacock 
that kind of I thing in, very uh, much so. of, of a man and uh, <laughs> probably rather interested in impressing uh, members of the op opposite sex so absolutely <laughs> but yeah <laughs> so the, I mean that's very interesting isn't it because these animalic smells that are used uh, in perfume so much musk and civet and castorium uh, or even ambergris some of them if, if, if you actually just smell the actual raw thing up close strong it really doesn't smell very appealing at all uh, but somehow Here's there's ambergris. this Right. Oh, wow. Okay. So this ambergris here, it's yeah. about $20,000 per kilo Jeez. US dollars. Wow. So that's, so, you know, that's 15,000 pounds a kilo. This uh -huh. one right there. And I use this one in my oak moss and forest florals, which is absolutely the worst name for the perfume. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. That was a very uh, interesting and powerful fragrance. Yeah. Well, come. Yeah. 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 It, but it did have um, a definite animalic tone to it. That's what, yeah, oak, oak moss and forest florals, right? Yeah, that's the rock. Go ahead, it, yeah, yeah. Like the party queen or something like that, because it's such an, um, or, you know, grand soiree or something, because it's it, that particular perfume that I use, lots of ambergris. I also use, you know, my civet tincture in it and right. a tremendous amount of jasmine absolute from India. Mm -hmm. It's it's like one of these very old, romantic, um, thick and rich perfumes. Um, this is actually the, this is what it looks like in full perfume form. This is the perfume wow. yeah. of my, um, before it's been tinctured, uh, right. of my oak moss and forest florals. And Got when it. I tincture it down, it's not yeah. much lighter than this. This is a sure sign, you know, if your viewers are buying perfumes, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll treat them well. You know, I know you yeah. have a very loyal crowd. Uh, I'll make up a nice batch for them, but it's thick and rich. And, and this is the jasmine and this is the oak moss in here. Yeah. So this is how you can tell it's definitely not IFRA compliant, you know. Yeah. Um, and on my bottles, so, so none of my perfumes are IFRA compliant. Um, I use all these tinctures. Um, and I use modern musks to give lift and diffusion to these very powerful natural materials. So um, what you'll find with uh, modern perfumes is that they're overdosed with musks. They're very diffusive, they're very ethereal, they're very light, they're very airy. Mm -hmm. And um, they're nice in that way, you know, but they don't have the same attitude or punch that a perfume from the 1920s would. A lot of people don't even know, aren't familiar with these older perfumes, but they were very yeah. strong and very impressive. Mm -hmm. What I've done is I've actually combined um, the old Ifra non-compliant, punchy, powerful oak moss, real bergamot, mm -hmm. real musks, with the ethereal f effects of um, modern musk, modern white musk. So okay. I'm trying to use both of best of both worlds, but this is vanilla. Wow. This is real vanilla tincture, vanilla bourbon beans from the coast of Mad from a small island called Bourbon Island just off the coast of Madagascar. Right. The best um, vanilla in the world. And I happen to know that that tends to be very uh, pricey, doesn't it? All of these things are very pricey. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, um, my perfumes are priced very low for my first year or two because I need to get a name and I need to build trust. Sure. Yeah. If you go into my Etsy, you'll see I've got all um, five star ratings, 500 orders, not a yep. problem. I'm trying to get a name. I use very good materials and I sell directly to the customers, not through mm -hmm. the stores. In yep. that way, I can actually still make a little bit of money and they can get a very good quality perfume at, at, at you know a very reasonable price. Absolutely, um, yeah. This is oud. You know, I use oud. Right. Um, and uh, everything, so, all the good stuff, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, I think that's it. No, no, of course, the fact that you're selling directly, because uh, I know, of course, once things go through a store, that that's a huge amount of the money goes to the store. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you're selling directly means that your prices are probably very, very reasonable. Just to mention the prices, I think I'm correct in saying for a, a full bottle, the size that you offer at the moment is they're all 30 mils, right? Yeah. And yep. those are, what's the price for one of those? 
It's only $160 Canadian. So on your store here, yeah, uh, one of your 30 mil bottles for us in the UK, uh, that's £102 in British money. Uh, so yeah. in the USA, you, we can translate that to a little, little bit more in dollars, but it gives you a rough idea. So I think it's a really accessible price yeah. for, uh, for me, you know, I've been into fragrances a while and I, I still love my cheap fragrances. I buy designer fragrances. I enjoy very mainstream stuff like Creed and what have you. But if I'm going to pay a reasonable amount of money for a perfume and I want to feel excited and feel that I'm getting something special, then I think these kind of, you know, this kind of price for a 30 mil of something that has got real, maybe real oak moss, real civet, things that I just can't find in a store. I think that's kind of where I want to spend my money. And you know, I wouldn't, I won't mention any other brands, but there are all kinds of brands that you might find in Harrods in Britain with amazing bottles, which cost sure. more than yours. Uh, but perhaps, you know, the fragrances to me wouldn't be quite so exciting. So I think this is, you know, I'm, I, not just your brand, but there are a few others like you where it's an artisanal perfumer. And I think yeah. if you can, you can get into this stuff, it's, it's sort of where the excitement lies for a lot of us. Uh, with big fragrance collections, you want something exciting. So you, you're using some of these old ingredients. However, I would stress that you know, if anyone thinks, oh, they're just going to all smell like they're really old fashioned or from the 70s or the 20s, it's, I get a lot of that kind of modern niche, whatever this, whatever that term means, but I, I think they're, they're still very wearable. And you, as you say, you are using some modern ingredients. And, you know, there's, there's stuff going on here that reflects the fact that we're in the 21st century as well as the, the old stuff that's, that's influencing you. Would, would that be a fair comment? This is a, exactly right, because every perfume material has its, its place. Um, it, it, that's exactly fair. That's, that's right. You know, I use the modern musks to give diffusion and to create a cloud around the wearer, and you'll notice that my perfumes last a very long time. And some of them are quite powerful. So I would say, so for example, with the birch, tar, um, uh, Russian birch tar perfume, yep. man, you only need one spray perhaps in the morning and then once around three o'clock in the afternoon and mm -hmm. you're set for the entire day. So, I mean, I feel like it's a good deal for the money. That totally. particular perfume's got a ton of real jasmine absolute and um, rose absolute from Morocco. So it's, it's quite good. Um, that's right. It, I do balance the uh, non-IFRA compliant materials, mm -hmm. the oak moss, um, all the naturals with the modern diffusive, lighter, more ethereal materials. Yeah. Let's get into the fragrances because it's high okay. time we actually got a bit more specific about a couple of them. So you very kindly sent me a sample set with uh, a number of, I think most of not everything, but a lot of your fragrances in it, which has been fantastic. And I've been trying them out. And, you know, I haven't had time to give a, a, an in-depth overview of every single one, but I'll touch on a few favorites and we can talk about, if you want to tell me which ones are your favorites or would be the best place to start, that kind of thing. But I'll kick off with one that I thought you had a great story about. And I think it's okay. a bit of a, a real wow factor fragrance. And this one is Golden Guy. Golden Guy, that right? right Golden Guy, right? <laughs> uh, is that it in there? This is the Golden Guy right here. You can see wow. her. And I this love is the, not, the decanter, the whiskey decanter style. That's good. This is diluted. Right. This yeah. Is I'm just trying to find it. Like, yeah. Like if you buy a perfume from me, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. Um, I suppose I could sell the entire decant, but uh, I haven't tried doing that yet. Um, so this perfume, what's in the Golden Guy? Yeah. Please let us know the notes. Yeah. I'm just looking for my sample here, so I can. So the Golden Guy. Yeah. First, we have Chambord Liqueur. Okay. So what I've done is there is a gentleman down the road from me in the city, right? In the city. Yeah. And he's from Persia, and he has a great collection of very high-quality pipe tobaccos, all sorts right. of different types of pipe tobaccos. And I brought this liqueur to his store, and I said, I need something that will go with this, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so he suggested one type of um, Virginia pipe tobacco. Apparently, Virginia Americans make the best tobacco in the world. Some of it, it's okay. quite good. Yeah, it's and, famous uh, Virginia tobacco. Yep, it's very nice. So I took a ton of um, Virginia 
uh, pipe tobacco, and I tinctured it in a couple bottles of Chambord. This is blackberry liqueur uh, from France. Okay? Right. So and you're saying the actual liqueur was involved? Yeah. You didn't just make a cake, because normally I think when I have a, a note listing that says rum, then they've got something that smells a bit like rum. But you literally... No, no, I've got it. It's tinctured. The rum in. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I took the tobacco and I tinctured it in a couple bottles of this and I let it sit for about six, eight months. Right. And then I strained it through and I reduced it down to an absolute. And to this, I added a material called oak wood CO2. And right. it's a steamed distillation, CO2. It's actually half rotten oak wood, very old oak wood, where they push the steam through this black, dark wood, and it's the booziest material. Those are the two primary materials that are in the Golden Guy. Um, and it's turned out quite interesting. Um, it's... It's a genuine tobacco note, and there is tobacco yeah. absolute in there as well. Um, right. I think it's a fascinating fragrance. I love the story behind it as well, which we'll come on to. But, yeah, on the smell, I mean, I'll just get, give you a uh, note listing officially on your on the samples, which uh, handily have the notes. We have mm. blackberries and rum, the Chambord liqueur, which you've just mentioned, blueberries, red wine, and genuine pipe tobacco. So it's, it's definitely really nice, boozy tobacco fragrance. I find sometimes that yeah, there are quite a few fragrances which have that boozy tobacco theme, maybe. Uh, but I certainly find things like maybe Tom Ford's Tobacco Vanille a little bit kind of gloopy and unctuous, and it's okay, but it's not my cup of tea. Uh, but this one really, I, I really felt like it, it had a really nice natural kind of green leafy tobacco thing, and like a really a nice smell of boozy liquor, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and uh, that also, once you told me the story about the area that it's based on, I thought it really um, encapsulated that idea really well. So the Golden Guy is in yeah. a, it's an area in Tokyo, right? Exactly right. And what, what happens there? What is it like? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens in Golden Guy stays in Golden Guy. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, but it's, it's an area of bars, right? Is that right? <laughs> Right, so um, okay. Tokyo is this fascinating city. All your viewers, you have to go. It's so safe. A lot of artists mm. just go to Tokyo to see how the Japanese people work. Mm. Just go and see how they work. Anyways, I, I could talk about that for days. But um, Tokyo has the world's largest red light district. It's called Kabukicho. Okay. And I would say Kabukicho probably has more than a thousand love hotels. Right, love three or three thousand restaurants. Okay, all every kind of service imaginable. Hosts, and they have hostess bars and host bars for the ladies, mm -hmm. where the ladies can go, okay. and they get served um, uh, beautiful liqueurs and champagne, and they're poured by handsome young men. Oh, okay, and that's so. It's equal opportunities. That's good. Good. Equal opportunities. Okay. The insides of these host bars are just, they're like glamorous mirrors everywhere, chandeliers everywhere. It is like Disneyland for the adult crowd after <laughs> hours. And it's probably got the GDP of like a small nation, just Kabuki right. show itself. It's massive. Anyways, inside of the heart of this world's largest red light district is the Golden Guy. Slightly different scene. The uh -huh. Golden Guy is Tokyo's oldest um, uh, black market. So just after World War II, when Tokyo was being picking itself up together, um, putting itself back together after the bombing raids, mm. there was an area of several, several hundred tiny little bars. Uh -huh. And initially, um, the patrons would... Um, sell cigarettes, sell kimonos um, out in front of the bars, small little black market inside the bar. First floor, right, they'd all have three floors. You would eat and drink with, with, with the lady there. And then second floor, um, you could pay your extra charge and, and get whatever service you like. And then she actually lived on the top um, 
uh, floor of, of this uh, little tiny little vertical bar units. Um, okay. And now today, you know, the prostitution is not there in the golden guy. What okay. it is is every bar seats about six people and they all have a different kind of theme. So you might go to one bar and it might be, you know, a flamenco dance bar. Have a couple drinks with your buddies. Six people, you're allowed to smoke inside, drink wine, drink your sham, you know, drink your sham board with a hostess. <laughs> um, and uh, go to the next bar and completely different interior, completely different theme. It might be like um, a professional wrestling, Mexican wrestling mask where oh, there's right. a transgender person behind the bar wearing a wrestling mask. Uh, with very voluptuous chest, and then everybody there gets served only German beers or something. Okay. And then you go to the next bar, and it might be covered in tin foil, roof to ceiling with red lights and disco balls. So it's a fantastic place to go on an adventure. Uh, and I used to hang out there because you get into the most interesting conversations. All the artists and the yeah. musicians, um, rock stars, uh, kabuki actors, um, hostesses, um, eccentric business people who are like novelists on the weekend. Right. Very creative crowd would um, hang out there. Uh, Quentin Tarantino's there all the time. Bjork is there all the time. Wow. Um, goodness knows who I've been drinking with, but the bar would stay open. The bars there would stay open all night. Yeah. And by the time four o'clock in the morning comes around, you're sitting there with your head on the counter and your hand on the bar <laughs> bottle. Yeah. And you're waiting about four fifteen, looking at your watch. Oh, when's that first train, right? Right. So my golden guy perfume. Yes. Tobacco infused mm -hmm. with liqueur and mm -hmm. absinthe. And absinthe, some, yes. Yeah, I remember absinthe. you met, yeah, yeah. That's not on my little sticker here, but that's, I like that, yeah. It's in Sorry. there. Mm. And you're just waiting to go home. And so I wanted to capture the hedonism of this place. Yeah. And I think I did. Um, and if, if your viewers go onto my website, uh, they'll see a friend of mine. She's a hostess and she lives in Vancouver now. She's a model. Oh, right. Um, it doesn't mean she is a prostitute. She's not. She's not. Sure. It's, it's a long conversation, but a hostess is a different thing. Yeah, I, um, I can understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if you guys have. Do you guys have them in England? They pour drinks and sit and chat with you. Uh, I'm sure there are bars where where that would happen and and nothing more goes on. Uh, obviously, uh, as you can tell, Matthew, I'm you know it's not the kind of circles that I move in. Uh, but I, I, yeah, we, we might do, but not quite. I, I have to admit, my last uh, pub crawl in Barnet High Street was slightly less hedonistic than this, so uh, it might be a, a new concept to some of our, our viewers. But yeah, I get the obviously. Yeah, there are hostesses who do simply uh, pour the drinks and that kind of thing. I'm sure we we all get. That, that, that's the distinction but there's a great uh, story and a nice idea that I mean all right. of that makes this sound like it might be like a, a really out there smell and it is beautiful but uh, it, it's it's not uh, something that you can't wear and it's it's not so hedonistic that no, people should no, be terrified no, no, no. because it's it's really quite balanced and, and a nice development on the skin and I'm, I'm just amazed actually because I didn't know that you could actually first of all I was surprised when you said you literally distilled a tincture from tobacco uh, yeah. And likewise, to actually get the rum thing from a, from the rum itself, I, I just yeah. assumed in my naive uh, lack of understanding of how fragrance creation works that that was virtually impossible. You just had to take some synthetic accord, which represented rum or brandy or whatever. So I think that that's the amazing selling point, really, for for me for your fragrances is this the uniqueness of what goes into them, uh, right. and a bit of your your own imagination that you've clearly got uh, for each. You know, these stories yeah. behind the fragrances are superb. I should probably get, we want to at least yeah. cover a couple of the, the more okay. noteworthy fragrances in the video. So let's just, uh, one of the other ones that I thought was very interesting was, uh, and then I'm going to ask you what ones you find, you know, your absolute favorites. But I think Civet Cat Sheepra is really cool. I really like this. Um, I'll just get give the viewers the note listing for this one. It's Bergamot. Clary Sage and Lavender. 
those are the top notes. Then you've got Jasmine, Absolute, Rose, Absolute, Ylang, Ylang, Musk, Ketone, Patchouli, and I think we've just seen this maybe in the bottle, Genuine Civet Musk. And it's a yeah. real uh, beautiful kind of powdery, old school classic fragrance with that distinctive civet note that I, I said it reminded me a little bit in passing of Guerlain's Jiki yeah. and an, another one, Mouchoir de Mouchoir, which is a real kind of a real if i thought of a dandyish fragrance actually it would be mouchoir de mouchoir but I'm, i can assure you i'm only going to be spraying it behind my ears not anywhere else um but maybe hey, you can just don't let us... me stop you, <laughs> no, don't... I'll, send you I'll send you some civet paste <laughs> you can put that don't wherever that you like home, you know folks. no we'll, we'll leave that one back in the 18th century <laughs> uh, but uh, just it, what, what was the thoughts behind civet cat sheep for them when you created it Right, so um, it, it's kind of a representation of my brand in that I believe um, we're too careful nowadays and yes. not human enough. So let, let me throw something sideways and then come, come, come back to a more logical yes. point of view. Um, so I think that if you can't bear um, a little bit of stink um, and if you cannot connect with other human beings um, uh, and their musk or natural, what it smells like to be naturally, to be like a human, I think, I don't think there's no, something necessarily wrong with you, but I don't believe you're engaging with life mm -hmm. um, to its fullest. So I, I think um, people who can't bear the smell of our other humans are probably not the greatest lovers, first of all. Okay. Um, second thing. <laughs> is I used to, and I still do, play jujitsu and, and wrestling, right? Right. And I believe that scent and the smell of human sweat is a form of communication. And the reason, for 10 years, I, I, I wrestled in Japan and played mm -hmm. jujitsu and mixed martial arts and that sort of thing. Right. And I did that because my Japanese language skills weren't very good. Mm -hmm. but, but when I wrestled with people, when I felt their kimono in my hand when I engaged with them physically it's a different kind of communication it's a tribalism it's a sort of in grouping thing and I think this is sort of a very primal means of communication nowadays mm -hmm. I I do believe that we are um, cutting ourselves off from the human side of other humans, the imperfections, the stink, that sort of thing. This is yeah. one reason why I am IFRA non-compliant because I just think there's too much um, in the way of be careful, don't be offensive, don't stink, be sterile, um, don't um, engage with people too deeply in conversation. You might find something that you disagree with or mm. um, all these sorts of things. I don't like it. And so the civet cat Shepra is, I wouldn't say I overdosed the civet musk in it, but I no. put it there as a kind of declaration. Okay, this is what it is to be a mammal or this is what it is to be a human being. So the <clears throat> civet material is buried in and amongst lots of florals, lots of rose and jasmine, but also the oak moss and all these other thick resinous materials. It's buried in there as <clears throat> a means of what the civet does is it combines these materials to the human skin. So civet, <clears throat> it's a musk from a mammal. We are mammals and it actually engages the other materials to your skin and you'll notice Mm -hmm. in this particular perfume that the dry down later on through the day it's quite beautiful mm -hmm. and I, a lot of it has to do with that pairing between um the uh, two mammals in and in, in the engagement yes, yes. Of, of, of the life i don't know if i'm making sense but yeah i absolutely well it makes perfect sense to me yeah and i mean i would stress actually that um although it says that, that you've, you've put civet in the name it's not just a civet fragrance i mean that's Absolutely one element not. of this and of course yeah if, if that's overdone it could be a bit much for some people but it's beautifully yeah. balanced with all kinds of other classic perfumery accords uh but yeah. i really yeah I, I totally agree with you that you know the, this idea that we should be totally afraid of anything dangerous or weird smelling or, or any these, these animalic notes is is kind of a, a, a sad thing in modern yeah. perfumery really uh, and of course, they were they were they were put into perfumes in the first place 
because yeah. they do have this sort of subconscious appeal to people yeah, even yeah. though they're kind of uh, a little bit funky these smells so yeah i think that's yeah I, I get the story behind that but this is a really well balanced uh, perfume that i think a lot of people are going to really enjoy lots of florals it does open up very nice and bright lots of genuine bergamot so when you first spray it you get this light ethereal effect to it um and then as it so i would say if i broke it down first 10 minutes a very light bergamot bright citrus mm. And definitely in the background, you can smell that civet up for sure. And then as it dries on one, we're going to one hour. It's more like um, a powdery floral, but with, you know, it's it's deep because it's got the um, patchouli and it's got the vetiver. So it's it's kind of drying down to a floriental, um, not spicy, but um, florals and, and uh, this mis mi mishmash of heavier elements of the woods uh, in there. And then finally the dry down, which actually I prefer uh, most in this whole perfume. It's a very um, powdery, slightly sweet, woody. Um, it's almost smells like a, like a real fur coat, I don't know. There's, it's slightly animalic and it's fuzzy and warm to it. So mm. look for the dry down. Yeah. Yeah, fuzzy and warm is a good one. I, I, yeah, I definitely get that powdery thing and there's definitely sweetness in there. So really, I mean, very much, I would say a unisex fragrance for anyone. Very unisex. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and you know, just if you like your old school fragrances a little bit, if you've got some favorite classics from Guerlain and that kind of classic, perfumery house that's been going for ages this gives you a little bit of that feel but it's it's i'm sure they don't use uh, this amount of the kind of real civet and stuff anymore so really really great stuff and, and one that really appealed to me so but it's about time i gave you a bit more choice so is there any other fragrance you would say is one you're most keen to, to share a little bit more information with us about um just a quick rundown, I guess I'll say, you know, the birch tar um, perfume. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Russian really powerful. Russian birch tar. That's Russian the name, birch right? Tar. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Very dense, um, very sweet, very fiery. Smells like you've been sitting around a bonfire. Yes. Very it's deep, smoky. Smoky. And it's a very Canadian um, perfume because it's got the, uh, de uh, sorry, beaver musk. Castorium. Right. Yep. Now, I get the Castorium from trappers in North Ontario. Well, right, okay. Mm -hmm. they, these are people that, um, they're native Canadian people. They lived a certain lifestyle for hundreds and hundreds of years. They survive. They're not making lots of money. They don't farm animals, but they mm -hmm. do trap animals for their furs. And mm -hmm. instead of just throwing away uh, the Castorium uh, musk, they sell them to me okay right and okay. and i'm supporting their way of life that they've been doing for hundreds of years i'm not going to judge them some people might disagree with it but you know yeah sure and no, I, <laughs> I just got a whiff of it yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and i think that that makes perfect sense obviously there are people out there who've, who've been doing this for this it's their way of life for generations and um yeah. if it's a byproduct of what they're doing anyway exactly. uh you know, many people will find that perfectly fine. This is really, um, I, th I would say this is quite a challenging fragrance and, and so you're going to either like it or you might be, it might be an instant no for many people, yeah. uh, frankly, but it's really, yeah. really, uh, again, very powerful. Uh, yeah. a birch tar is traditionally, that note is associated with a leathery feel, right? Is yeah. that right? Yes. And it's definitely got yeah. that, that real, I mean, Going on a more mainstream scent, of course, Birch is famous in Aventus uh, by Creed oh, for God, creating the this. But it's, it, yes, yeah. <laughs> but that, even that amount gives the Aventus its its supposed famous smoky undertone. So uh, Birch, yeah, apparently, yeah. So um, I'm just saying, maybe if people think of smokiness, Birch tar, these things go hand in hand. But this one really has a, a bonfire thing, um, that kind of thing of if you you walk past somewhere where wood has been burned the day before or the, the smell is still in the air the next day it really gives you that and it's it's, it's you know, 100 it's extremely smoky and the yeah. people who love it 
absolutely love it. They can't get enough of it. Um, but it's not for everyone. It's not mm. for everyone. Um, this is and then, uh, a pretty badass fragrance. This is yeah. kind of. Uh, <laughs> it is. I think guys who are really rugged and masculine could really, really enjoy. I mean, forget Tuscan leather by Tom Ford. You know, this is uh, leather That's on about, the next level, really. Yeah. Yeah, mine's about ten times stronger than Tuscan leather. Yeah. Very exactly. powerful. And it's sweet. But, it's sweet. So it could be yeah. unisex as well. It could be unisex. Mm, yeah, and I don't know if it, you yeah. notice it, but mm. there's a lot of florals buried deep inside of there. There's little nuances of all these mm -hmm. um, sweet facets within that. So that's an interesting one. Yeah, well, your note listing includes jasmine, rose, and ylang lang. So, and yeah, the, we've got vanilla in the base. So yeah, okay, that, that definitely is one of the sort of... Um, benchmark fragrances I guess would, would be a real wow factor one yeah, yeah go ahead sorry very different very different very different yeah um, I guess one more um, you know what it, it if people want to try every fragrance is quite different from each other and I do have the 10 sample pack um, oh yeah that's worth mentioning yeah so they, they can get a sample pack of 10 yeah yeah right. and the sample pack itself is uh, um, it's a hundred dollars for ten at three milli, mm -hmm. so um, you get quite a bit of perfume. They're very, very powerful, very strong. So you only need one or two sprays. They do last. Yeah, I feel like I've got a real, quite a good amount of juice here, and I guess I mean that rough, roughly works out similar value to the actual bottles. So in a way, that's kind of you know gives you the chance to have the whole collection, and then maybe you pick your favorite to actually get a bottle. So I think it's good value. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like, yeah, I'll just show the viewers because you, you get, sometimes I'm frustrated when I, I get samples from a brand and it's a really tiny sample and the sprayer doesn't, it, the sprayer gives a tiny, tiny dot, but the, these are like a proper sprayer and you yeah. really, you can really wear them and, and enjoy them. And yeah, as you say, there's yeah. quite a lot of wearings in every bottle here. Yeah. yeah, it's all, everything's yeah. done by hand. Mm. Um, most of the perfumes, you know, they have tons and tons of naturals. Uh, I always engage, you know, sell direct. If any of the your viewers have any problems mm -hmm. with the order, just give me a call, and I give people my telephone number, or email, or they just contact me directly on Etsy. Um, it's my first year in business, and my yeah. intention really is to meet as many cool people as I can, um, such as yourself, but also, you know, customers, and um, just making those connections and and giving. Um, I think my perfumes are for real perfume enthusiasts looking for something different um, mm. and, 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 and unique. So um, don't be afraid to contact me and I'll always make up a good batch for them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Agreed. One more that I just wanted to ask. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this one though, because I don't think it's released yet, but you sent me Not a Fougere. Uh, everyone who knows my channel probably knows that I'm quite uh, interested. I love Fougeres. It's kind of my favorite yes. style. Uh, so you've yep. got a, a Fougere in the in the works. Is that right? Yeah, yep. just okay. Melic Fougere. <laughs> no. It's yep. going to be called Melic Fougere. It's going to be called Melic Fougere. Awesome. And I'm actually and waiting to hear from your, your impressions and... Um, uh, well, but I'm going to release it, yeah, because I've just gotten the new, nice new big fridge and I can keep all the citruses and uh, the herbs and lavenders and rosemaries cool. nice and fresh. Yes. And so I'm going to be rela releasing that maybe in the spring, maybe in the yeah, spring. Makes sense. And, um, yeah, so this one, can you let us know, I mean, I found it to be very, very appealing, very classic. Uh, it has, a, I found a definite twist of mint in it, which I really enjoyed very aromatic, very herbal. Uh, and then I found that you said, oh, well, actually, part of the inspiration was an old recipe from, well, I think it was an old English brand, wasn't it? Yeah, I think Are it was. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I think the inspiration is from um, one of the first very, very old formulas from Floris. Yes, uh, that's what I you understand, said, yeah. And he came over from Spain, maybe Malaga, uh -huh. Spain, and then yes, he landed yeah, in England, so. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he brought with him some some of the know-how from the Arabs and tracing back through history and to Venice and Medici yeah. and whatnot. And 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 I found some of these old formulas, and it's very inspired by this. Brilliant! It's so vibrant and it's kind of green. It's it's very fresh. 
this yeah. one, I mean, is very, very easy to wear and easy to like, I think, you know, it's, yeah. it's not too polarizing. It's just beautifully fresh and really, really natural smelling. I love that kind of, I love that fresh mint leaf. It's not, not like toothpaste or peppermint sweets, but that the actual green leaves of the mint, I get a little, that, I always love that in a fragrance. And yeah. I think, yeah, just such an uplifting, vibrant kind of green smell. And it actually smells so sort of contemporary and, and in tune with other things I can get now that I like. I'm almost surprised that its starting point was a really old Fougere recipe because sometimes mm. I think, oh, they probably smelled really weird, but this one no. smells great to me. No, so no, cool. no. And I did use the English lavender in there. Ah, um, yes. You tell me that apparently our lavender world. is good over here, right? It's very good. It's very, good. very, it's some of the finest in the world. English lavender is very good. Okay. And um, the Americans make incredible mints. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in the dry down in that one's quite nice as well. Wait, wait for the dry down. It's it's a bit lasting actually for a fougere. Um, tons and tons of natural materials, you know, in, okay. in that it's it's a high and quality. And there's some some oak moss in there. Real oak moss, absolutely. Okay. Real bergamot, real clary sage, right. real yeah. English lavender. Not just um, linalool or linal acetate, yeah, right. or citral or something. No, yeah. no, no. The real materials. So by using a ton of these. Um, toppy, high, uh, bright, natural materials, you get that brightness, but you also get the nuance of the real materials. It's not cheap to make that one, you know. I'm not mm. making a killing with it. Um, no. I should, should probably not say that, but it's, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quality um, fougere. I can believe that. Okay, well, I'm definitely going to buy at least one, but I'm, I'm going to um, keep testing them. But it, the front runners for me at the moment Probably either Golden Guy or the Fougere. Uh, maybe the Civet Cat Sheep Prep, but I need to try the others a little bit more. Uh, people can find all the information about each one if they go to the, the what, what we've linked below, and yeah. there's a description of each one there. Um, yeah. So, oh, just, yeah, so uh, on the Fougere, do we any hint when that might become available? Do you know? I'll have to talk to you offline because oh, okay. I would love to do the release through you because I know oh, okay. um, you're a proper uh, British gentleman and, and keen on the fougere. Wow. So we'll <laughs> have to do that. We'll have to do some chatting. All right. uh, I'm thinking spring, but um, you know Makes more sense. about the marketing stuff than I do. So, so oh, we'll, no, we'll talk about that. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad I give the impression of being a gentleman. <laughs> You might be dis disappointed if you get to know me better. We're, we're going to sort of bring it towards the end there, and I'm just going to okay. ask a few slightly more trivial questions about okay. stuff. So um, just wonder, do you watch a, a lot of YouTube yourself? Do you watch either any fragrance reviewers or anything else on YouTube? Just okay, YouTube. Uh, good yeah. question. What I watch is I'm not – okay, this sounds terrible. I'm not so yeah. highly influenced by other um, perfumes, but I watch videos – of other artists. So okay. yesterday I watched a great show of this um, Southern American guy, this black guy. He goes mm -hmm. out in the forest, he finds great trees, he cuts them down, mm -hmm. and then he roasts entire pigs and he does the whole process himself. So okay. I loved it. And then I watched a video of Patek Philippe's handmade watches. Oh, so wow, I yeah. I yeah. love using YouTube as a source of inspiration mm -hmm. for handcrafted, good quality materials. Uh, when I'm sitting at my desk, when I'm making notes, when I'm studying, when I'm trying to make a good product for people, I turn to YouTube to see how other people do this. And um, that's what I use YouTube for. That makes sense. Good. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're doing fragrances, I mean, even me, I make fragrance reviews. I don't actually want to spend all my time watching <laughs> fragrance reviews on YouTube. So I get inspiration for my videos from people who do something completely different because if you just watch what you're doing anyway, then it's, it becomes kind of boring and stale for you. So I totally get that. Okay, brilliant. What do you like to drink when you're doing a bit of boozing, apart from Chambord liquor? What, what do you have a go-to drink if it's a party time? I would say, okay, I am a terrible guy. Um, I, I'm not the biggest drinker, and I'll tell you oh. what. When I drink, I do drink to get drunk. So okay. when I drink, yeah. I'll drink anything, just yeah. as long as I'm having a good time. And okay. I really hope for this COVID to end because we're mm. going to hang out in Milan. And uh, 
in the springtime and yeah. whatever you hand my way I will <laughs> I will go for it I do I do um, get inspiration actually though from drinks so some of the darker darker beers you know I would love to make a perfume that smells somewhat right. Guinness you know a yes, malt okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Dark, um, balsamic um, liquor and um, I really have to get into that more um, mm. not a drinker but um, uh, so either I'll be drinking to get drunk or I'll be drinking to analyze it for ideas to make perfumes. Sounds horrible, but uh, okay. That's what I do. Okay, that's I like that. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that answer. Um, that's great. Do you have a? Are you interested in sports? And do you have a favorite sports team over there? I am. I'm. I'm. I'm a martial artist all the way through. So right. I have been wrestling and playing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Wow. and boxing and kickboxing and, and that sort of thing for for quite a number of years i'm terrible at it but it's it's part of my way of living so so that's what i do okay. um, sports teams not a whole lot i know you you guys follow the football uh and but uh i don't know if i go to england you know you have to take me to the bar and then we'll go watch some of the football you teach me about that all right I'll hold you to that. Okay. Um, I think that brings us more or less to the end of our, our chat. I think it's been an absolute thrill to find out about your brand. And I, I knew once I, I first saw the bottles, which I, there will be a couple of bottles will appear on the screen during the video. So people have a little okay. look at that. Um, and I think that that's sort of, I'm pretty simple. So the, the, the visual thing appealed to me first. And I knew that the idea of them being uh, old school fragrances and, and breaking the for rules a bit was very enticing and uh, certainly when I've had the opportunity to talk to you and more importantly to smell the fragrances uh, it's been in everything I, I could have hoped for and more so very excited to, to keep trying these fragrances I hope the viewers have enjoyed finding out about them something a bit different for the channel and yeah. uh, I think we'll hopefully have you on again before too long on the channel if you can spare the time I'm here. I'm always here for you. I, we'll, we'll talk about that, Fougere. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. You guys across the pond, be well. Take care. Um, take care in the COVID season. We'll get through the winter. Spring will come around. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, don't be afraid. Contact me. Any questions anybody has. Um, I love crafting that relationship directly with the customers. I'm here to take care of you. So, guys, be well. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in the next video. Take care of yourselves. And remember, whatever you're doing in life, let's project. Bye-bye. See you, guys. Bye-bye.